Hello. Welcome everyone. We're gonna get started in just a couple minutes here. Thanks for joining. Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm gonna go ahead and start with the introductions, which are long. So I know that there are gonna be more people joining us. So, um, so welcome um, everyone. I'm Karen Kinzel. I'm the director of the Palo Alto Arts Center. So delighted to have all of you here this afternoon and to have Christine Wong Yap and Marcel Pardo Arisa with us as well. So uh, this is a program offered in conjunction with Creative Attention, which is an initiative at the Art Center focused on individual and community wellness, resilience, and recovery. The project includes an exhibition on view through May 21st, two artist residencies, which we're going to talk about today, art therapy workshops with provisional art therapist on Tron at community sites, and wellness programs, including free virtual meditation sessions with Julie Forbes on Thursdays at noon, which I hope you'll join us for. I want to thank the funders who helped to make this initiative possible. The Institute of Museum and Library Services, the National Endowment for the Arts, and Pamela and David Hornick. I also want to thank all of our members, donors, and supporters, and our board members. There are a few of us in the talk today for your support. I also want to thank Karen and Paige, who are behind the scenes, helping us to ensure that we have a successful Zoom uh, artist talk today. Also want to acknowledge Ann Trinka, who's here with us, the guest curator for Creative Attention. Before I introduce the artists, I want to share that on Saturday, March 12th, we are hosting an Arbor Week Festival with Canopy at the Art Center from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Paige just put a link uh, to more information in the chat. Please join us for art activities, tree walks, and a chance to meet creative attention artist Paz de la Calzada and learn about her project focused on El Palo Alto. I also want to remind you all that we're hosting a free in-person community day event for creative attention on Sunday, April 10th, featuring everything from art making activities to a sound bathing experience with Kenyatta Hinkle, a tea ceremony with Paz de la Calzada, and a drag performance with Grace Towers that I know Marcel is going to talk a little bit more about. Uh, there are links for that in the chat as well, so please join us. Christine Wong Yap is a visual artist and social practitioner working in community engagement, drawing, printmaking, publishing, and public art. She partners with organizations to conduct participatory research projects to explore dimensions of psychological well being, such as belonging, resilience, interdependence, and collaboration. She's participated in over a dozen residencies and studio programs. She's based in the San Francisco Bay Area after a decade of living in New York City. Welcome, Christine. Marcel Pardo Arisa was born in Bogota, Colombia and is a trans visual artist and curator that explores the relationship of representation, kinship, and queerness through constructive photographs, color sets, and installations. Their practice celebrates the so-called erroneous, navigates intergenerational connection, and questions arbitrary paradigms while pushing against the boundaries of photography. Arisa is the recipient of numerous awards. Their work has recently been exhibited at the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, the Richmond Art Center, San Francisco Art Commission Galleries, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, Palm Springs Art Museum, the Institute of Contemporary Art in San Jose. Arisa is a former member of the Curatorial Council at Southern Exposure, a co-founder of Art Handlers, and a studio member at Minnesota Street Project. 
So our format today is going to have each artist present, and then I'll have a few questions, and then we can open it up to additional questions and thoughts from a larger audience. So we're going to have Marcel go first. Welcome, Marcel. Thank you, Karen. Um, hi, everyone. My, my name is Marcel Pardariza. Uh, as Karen just mentioned, um, I'm very happy to be here, and I really appreciate you all taking the time to share this space together. Um, I know that now that we're existing in digital spaces more, uh, this is kind of like a new format. But so I'm just gonna share a little bit about my work uh, for 15 minutes and then, yeah, we're gonna open it up for questions. So I'm gonna share here. All right, so here's my info. And this is, um, this is actually a photograph from the, show that I just had in LA called After Touch. And I wanted to start with this poster uh, that was made in 1970 by the Gay Liberation Front that has really sort of influenced my practice. And these were flyers that said, touch one another. And they were distributed in queer bars for people to sort of take up space. And I love the poetry around how touch was a way of building community and building queer community specifically. Um, and this poster, I got to see it first because David France was curating this exhibition uh, at the Palm Springs Art Museum. And it was called Touching History. And he included my work um, that I made in 2018, which were this frame uh, photographic pieces that were bringing up pieces of queer archives. Um, here you can see some of them with people who are living here in the Bay Area right now. And this body of work was really thinking about Bay Area in a, you know, two decades ago versus the Bay Area now and trying to have a transhistorical connection between the two. And I really like the idea that you could include multiple temporalities in one physical object and that you could see also the texture of photography and how it has changed. Um, so what I was doing was looking through the archive, choosing some images, printing them uh, life size and then having this photographic moment with, uh, with friends and artists that are living here today. And you can see the graininess of like the Xerox prints versus the digital sort of more, um, you know, refined nature of digital photography and how they've changed over time, but also how certain aesthetics remain the same, especially when it comes to queer um, symbology and like semiotics. This was a little bit, this was the installation view of the Palm Springs Art Museum. Uh, so one thing that I wanted to mention was um, my work with the GLBT Historical Society. So I'm originally from Colombia and the fact that the Bay Area had this idea of a queer archive really blew my mind just because I feel like queer history in so many places has been hidden for so long. And the idea that we have a space where you hold these histories with care um, felt so moving to me and I just kind of like dived right in. And this is relatively recent when you think about it, like 1985 wasn't many years ago. Um, so I feel like that legacy is still being built and I really like the idea that we can invite those histories back. So I'm gonna share uh, about my project called King Streets, which you can see some of the pieces right now, the Palo Alto Art Center. And when I was thinking about King Streets, I was proposing uh, these posters that were gonna be exhibited at Market Street in the bus shelters. And because they were going in the bus shelters, I really wanted this idea that queer people were waiting with you in the bus because sometimes you don't feel that safe in public space, right? Um, we don't think about it so often in places like the Bay Area, but even in other places in um, the United States or you know, outside the United States, you definitely don't feel that safe. So I wanted to have that sense of community waiting with you in the bus. And when I was thinking about it, you know, this was a proposal, it was 2019. So I made that photograph in my studio and then, you know, the pandemic hit and I was, you know, all the photo shoots get, got canceled. And I was really thinking about a way of making this project feasible within the new restrictions that we were dealing with. Um, so then I decided to just meet people in public spaces and the spaces that they were spending time in. Uh, these were five bartenders that were working in a bar in the Mission District. And I kind of juxtaposed them with 
an image from the GLBT Historical Society. And so I wanted all of these collective moments to exist in one moment in space. And because the images were gonna go into Market Street, I wanted the photographs that I chose to also be um, visible in Market Street as well. This is another example. And these are two folks, um, Sir Jock, who is an amazing voguer here in the Bay Area, and then Cece Slays, who was kind of like a mentee uh, of Sir Jock. And here we are seeing them dancing. Uh, and this is actually like a part of a mission um, of the Everett High School, middle school in the mission. And then there's these photographs um, that was taken in 1977 in City Hall. And this opportunity for me was thinking about highlighting people in the Bay Area who are doing incredible work today. And what's interesting about this was, sorry about that, um, really inviting everyone that I knew in community that I had met through nightlife um, and just hanging out in queer spaces and really bringing them together uh, to create this artwork. And the cool thing about this is that I would send the photo to folks and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, photographing you with this people in this photograph, what do you think? And so then people would get either creative or they would wear clothes that kind of like match uh, what people were wearing. And I really love the idea that I was work, you know, I was walking with this cutout of cardboard with this beautiful queer people um, in public space. And we were kind of making a happening out of making these photographs. And for me also was important to have that uh, visual element of like the King Streets around it as a way of linking them all together when you were walking in um, public space. Uh, this is actually uh, the Stud Collective who is, uh, you know, they were, they had this stud bar that was funded since 1966. It was about to close in 2016 and they all got together to save the bar. Uh, sadly, the bar closed in 2020, but hopefully they will reopen again. So I also wanted to honor the people that are often, you know, not, getting the highlight but are also creating really um, inclusive and beautiful spaces for people to be their fullest selves and sadly because they all existed in public space uh, you know they were in downtown not a lot of people were spending time there so there was also this eeriness about everyone hanging out in market street okay everyone meaning uh, the people in the photographs, but not a lot of other folks around. So I also love that in a weird um, sort of odd way. Um, this is folks from the transgender district. This is Arya Said and Spring like, Collins and Janelle Gloucester. seeing like, you know, some unfair. Uh, and then, um, sorry about that. That was funny. Um, yeah, so these are folks from the transgender district who have made up, you know, they're the first legally recognized district in the world. They're in the Tenderloin in San Francisco um, and they're making so many initiatives to make, um, yeah, just make folks who live there um, to have like economic opportunities and have housing that is affordable and it's also like dignified in a way. And their staff has grown so much in the last two years just because people are actually supporting this project in like a tangential, in a tangible way. This is Jampy Star, um, who is an amazing dancer and a performer. And I wanted to showcase them too here. And something that was really beautiful about this project was that, you know, I, I feel like for the proposal, you only had to do six posters and I ended up doing 18. And now that I have some perspective, I realized that it was also my way of coping with the pandemic, was also meeting people and checking in with them and seeing how they were doing um, with everything that was happening. This was with Nicole Santa Maria, who is the director of El Para Trans Latinas, an organization that works with transgender folks in the Mission District. And Nicole has, she, she's a character and she has around 15 birds and so when I asked her if she wanted to be part of this um, project, she, she asked me if she could bring one of her birds. So I love that there was also this interspecies care and connection brought into the project. And then fabulous drag queens 
uh, Nikki G's, Milisha Skant, and Amura T's. And with some of the photos, I wanted to include archival images, and with some of them, I wanted them to stand on their own. And then Grace Towers, who I'm going to talk about later, to a dear friend who has been a collaborator for many years now. So I had made this map so you get an idea of where all the posters were placed in all the different bus shelters. So you could really go um, you know, on a stroll and you could kind of see all the posters and kind of like imagine all the memories of people. So I'm also gonna share this video that we ended up making because I wanted not only to have images but also to invite people to activate those public spaces. So this is a short, uh, a short video I'll show with you. Kaboom, everybody knows when I step in the room Freddy here and I take you to the tomb Take you to the graveyard, take you to your dooms That East Bay, vibe to the one oh. Brown skin, thick ass, never humble So pay homage, and Vegas to your man Give it up like he was raised damaged Anyway, if we talk about coins, I got him I was on top, but I ain't such a power bottom I ain't got no enemies, I already fought him And the haters, I can never see this bottom Got him, how I'm unclockable, unstoppable And so severe, it's the big court premiere Could I be more clear? I'm only chilling with the top tier Survival of the fittest and your ain't stop tier I've been putting in some hard work Rocking on sweats, old t-shirts I'm on my grind these days You know how this thing works Tied on back on my beaver I was sitting in the back and like a reaver yeah. But I be putting in some hard, hard work Yeah, I be putting in some hard, hard work Yeah, I be putting in some hard, hard work I hope you all enjoyed that. So that video was really fun to make because it was also a way of inviting people who were part of the posters and to showcase what they do every day and what makes their practice so special. Uh, we also, in that video, got to collaborate with Freddie, who makes amazing music and is also an amazing performer. Uh, they have their music online. You should check it out. Uh, and then also part of that, we were um, in a moment where people were voting, all these drag queens were doing all this activist work in San Francisco. Um, and here's Juanita Moore, who has been doing activist work in San Francisco for like three, four decades now. And also Honey Mahogany, who is one of the first trans leaders of the San Francisco Democratic Party. Uh, so we got to do this photo shoot in City Hall when they were doing a lot of organizing with many drag queens in San Francisco. And to me, that's really powerful, the, the way that drag queens are utilizing political space with a lot of creativity and also like collective uh, movement. And so for, for the Palo Alto Art Center, I wanted to include some of the King Street photographs that I just showed you, but I also wanted to do um, this sort of collage of all of the images together. And I'll just show you how we did it. Um, and I'm gonna be mindful of time. So I'll just stop right there. And then if you have questions, I'm happy to, to elaborate. I don't know, Karen, are you gonna jump back in? I Perfect, I can just say thank you, Marcel. And now I'm excited uh, for Christine Wong Yap to talk a little bit about her work and her project at the Art Center. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. I am gonna share a little bit of background about some of my previous projects, exploring belonging, and then um, show you some of the process of the residency that I did. So this is the very brief artist statement that I've written. I use drawing, printmaking, and social practice to explore subjective well-being and positive psychology, which I define as what people do to increase or maintain their subjective well-being. This is a quote from Louisa McCall. And when I read it, I thought, 
this is like an artist statement that somebody else wrote for me because it's so um, perfect to my practice and what I would like to do. She wrote, what if we consider artists as researchers who can design, experiment, fail, innovate and contribute to society's knowledge production to regain our sense of connection, agency and empathy, which are vital to a just and sustainable society, we must consider the different kinds of questions and outcomes artists are proposing as indispensable to our systems of knowledge production. So um, I just like this quote because there's a lot of things that relate to my own practice, but I also like bringing up this quote in the context of an artist in residency talk. Um, uh, I think when residencies are hosted by organizations that have established relationships with community organizations and with community members, artists and residents can more easily engage those communities. And when I'm an artist in residence and uh, people share their feedback or grassroots knowledge with me, I think of them as gifts, which when applied can improve cultural competence, accessibility and inclusion. So I'll share a few past projects that I've done. I've done three. The first one was in Albuquerque. I asked people where they felt a sense of belonging. And then I commemorated 13 places with these hand painted signs with actual quotes from members of the public. Sometimes we ask for permission to install the signs. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a real brief overview. That's. Um, the next project I did was with um, the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, I did a bunch of community workshops with the previous project, as well as with this project, um, as well as hosting an open call. I ended up creating 25 certificates that are partly letterpress printed and partly um, hand lettered. And then I actually went to Simon and worked with people at the locations to install them. Uh, this is one of my favorite, um, well, th there's 25 and there's many favorites, but this is one that I've been thinking about a lot. It's from an artist named Rodney Ewan. And his quote is that I can be my whole self vulnerable and unguarded. And I've been thinking a lot about um, belonging and how it is very similar to psychological safety, which is the freedom to reveal your most authentic self without fear of judgment or recrimination. And I've also been thinking about how you can't feel a sense of psychological safety if you do not have a sense of physical safety. And I think Marcel's um, talk when they mention being at the bus stop and not feeling safe I think that is a really palpable and embodied feeling that a lot of people have um, in different ways. And I think, you know, it is all very connected. I think a lot of belonging connects to self care and to well being. And it also connects to social justice and being safe in your street and being free from violence. So then I got to go on kind of a secret tour where I visited these different places and presented the certificate and um, either installed them myself most of the time, or in this case, uh, William Rhodes, who's an artist who co-founded the collective that Rodney uh, nominated. Here he is uh, putting up the certificate in his studio. So then I collected all these stories about the certificates as well as many other stories and uh, created this 116 page book called 100 Stories of Belonging in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, one of the things that I really take away from this project is that at the time when I did this project, it was 20, 2018, 2019. And a lot of my friends in the Bay Area had such a sense of embattlement there were artists, cultural workers, teachers, and the cost of living had skyrocketed so much and so many um, local institutions had to close or move away that um, it was a, a sense of like wariness. And one of the things that was really nice was when people 
read the book and they said that um, the book reminded me, them of what's still here and what's still worth fighting for. So I really like that. Um, so this is a spread from the inside of the book. You'll see that there are different underlines and tabs in different colors. That's because in the back of the book, we actually created an index of 15 qualities of belonging that came straight out of the text. I thought I had included one slide uh, that I usually include because I love to talk about it, but I think I took it out just for time's sake. But I will mention that one of the places of belonging was actually the stud, which uh, Marcel had photographed the worker co-op um, uh, in, in their project too. So that's a nice overlap. The third project about belonging that I did is this one that resulted in a 56 page comic book. This is in collaboration with the Chinese Culture Center of San Francisco. By the way, I forgot to mention that the first project was with Sanitary Tortilla Factory, which is an artist studio and gallery um, in Albuquerque. So with this project, it was cool because it was my most bilingual project. Um, everything was, there is the English and Chinese comic book that was available. Um, and so I had started to ask, I started out by asking what is a, a place where you feel a sense of belonging. And over time, I have started to evolve more questions and more understandings of belonging. So freeing belonging from being tied to a place and um, thinking about belonging as something you might carry with you is one way of expanded things. And also trying to expand to give people space who don't feel a sense of belonging to talk about what, what their sense of belonging might feel like if they could envision having it. So inside the comic book, there's three types of pages. There are these illustrated maps of places of belonging. And then there are these multi-vocal street scenes. And again, all these quotes are actual quotes from real people. One of the things that was interesting about um, this project was just learning how much culture is such an important part of people's experience of Chinatown. Because I had asked people about art and culture how art and culture impact their sense of belonging in San Francisco, Chinatown, and Manila Town. And a lot of people just like to talk about culture. And a lot of people also talked about public space. Um, so there is something there about like the commons and what we can learn from places like Chinatown. And then the last thing is um, these intergenerational um, stories. They're usually, they're first person narratives that are told um, from one person's perspective, but it also often tells the story of many generations of this person's family in their relationship to Chinatown or Manila Town. All right, so that's the backdrop for some different projects I've done on belonging. What I've done here with Palo Alto Art Center is ask similar questions, but only in this case, I'm kind of stepping back from being the person whose hand is in all the outcomes. Um, so with this project, I conducted a series of workshops. First, I led a workshop about belonging and calligraphy at Eastside College Preparatory School in East Palo Alto. Um, Eastside helps ready first-generation students from low-income families to attend and succeed in four-year colleges. So this is an example of one of the students' calligraphy. And this is like a statement about um, a place of belonging. And then I led a similar workshop at the Palo Alto Art Center with the Teen Leadership Program. And these are some of uh, what they did. And then we partnered also with Avenidas, which is a senior service organization in Palo Alto. And then I invited the Teen Leadership Program to interview some of the seniors at Avenidas. So this is Christine who's being interviewed by, uh, she was interviewed by Anya, Ilya, and Kim. This is Eleanor, and um, she's being interviewed by Sarah, and I think it's Elise, but I can't remember. And then, um, then after that, we also shot photographs of the seniors to use as references, and I led a comic book style portrait drawing workshop. So here's Charlie working on an illustration of Mark. And then in the back is Amber working on an illustration of Laura. 
And in addition to doing these workshops, um, we also wanted to create a collective map of places of belonging. So this is an interactive activity in the Nook Gallery and anybody can come and take one of these map markers, which you see on the right and um, add their place of belonging. And in this case, the map is focused on Palo Alto and East Palo Alto, uh, which is the Ohlone village of Lambton. And there's also a map of the world in recognition that so many immigrants from all over the world also uh, live in the area and might feel their place of belonging is somewhere else than this local area. So finally, what I'm doing is um, producing this zine. This is the cover. Um, I've done some other zines and publications and it was, there's a little moment of like twinge in my heart when I was like, oh, I have to draw the youth and the seniors talking and they have to be wearing masks. And it's just like a way of reflecting this moment that we're in, in the pandemic. Um, so the zine has um, perspectives from youth and elders and uh, there's maps of places of belonging. There's also a world map to reflect some of the things that what people from the public uh, added to the wall in the Nook Gallery. And then these are some of the portraits from the teens. Um, I am really impressed <laughs> by their drawing ability. I know I couldn't draw like that in high school. Um, so it's been a lot of fun to see you know, when you offer a few tools and tips and tricks, like what the teens come up with. Here's some more portraits. And then um, these will also form an installation that will get added to the creative attention exhibition in the first foyer um, next week. And then the zine will also be available for free for anyone to come by and pick and these are some of the certificates of places of belonging with the calligraphy from teens from both programs. All right, stop here. Thank you so much, Christine. I wanted to circle back to Marcel, who was so sensitive about time that they neglected to mention that um, their project here at the Arts Center. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Marcel for that. Yes, thank you so much. Also, Christine, that was great. It, just to learn more about your practice. I feel like I've seen it from afar and it's always good to be like um, a little bit more into it. Um, but yeah, I can just share really quick what I, what I kind of missed. Uh, so uh, similarly to Christine, I will be working with Avenidas, uh, with the senior uh, center. And what I'm hoping to do is have that intergenerational connection, both between their stories and also their images, right? Because in this archive, sometimes what I find is that we are saving like the iconic images of queer leaders, um, and important historical moments, but I'm also interested in saving moments that are, that are a little bit more mundane uh, about friends sharing space or, you know, queer family and chosen family. And so I will be meeting with them in this month and also in April to do a couple of workshops and also to bring some of the stories and their images to life. Um, yeah, and then as part of the residency, I will also be doing, uh, organizing a drag performance uh, with Grace Towers, who I had talked uh, about late, uh, before. And Grace Towers and I go way back, right? Just, just when I moved to San Francisco, they did a, um, a performance at El Rio, this queer bar in San Francisco. And I was kind of like, I need to meet this person. So we just started hanging out uh, and seeing each other in, at different events. And eventually we, we did the video together that you just saw. Um, and then, so they also are part of this organization called Queen of the Castro, and they also do Drag Lab, which um, does a lot of uh, workshops for queer teens to sort of feel empowered and supported uh, to be their fullest selves. So Grace is going to host this performance that's going to be happening on April 10th 
at 10 p.m. as part of the um, community day that is going to be happening at the Palo Alto Art Center. And this is some of the drag performers that will be uh, showcasing, um, you know, that will be featured in the drag performance. And what we were thinking about when we were uh, putting this cast together was has highlighting different houses of drag performers in the San Francisco Bay Area. So if you're free, come by, it will be really fun. It'll be cute. Uh, we'll have a good time all together. Awesome. Thank you again, Marcel and Christine. Um, before we turn it over to questions from our audience, I've got a couple for both of you. Um, and the first one, Christine's work, as we've learned, has focused on belonging and its impact on well-being. And Marcel's work in Kin Street celebrates visibility as a way to showcase resilience, well-being, and community. I wonder if each of you could speak to how being seen connects to belonging and to individual and community well-being. Well, I have some thoughts. This is a little bit of an easy one for me because I actually think that belonging is feeling safe, seen, and accepted. Um, so that's one definition. I don't think that's the only definition, um, but I think it's important to mention that it's not just feeling seen. And I think the bus stop artwork that Marcel shared um, is a great example of that. Like maybe visibility in and of itself is not necessarily a good thing. If you're in a place that's dangerous, you don't wanna be seen. Um, so I think there's something about visibility can be a marker. When you want to be, be seen, visibility can be a marker of the safety of a space that characterizes a place of belonging. Um, I have a bunch of other thoughts too, but I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's actually a really interesting thought because when I think about visibility, I think about it in a two-edged sword type of thing, right? So if someone, uh, you know, if someone's being visible is because they're standing out from something that's so-called normal, right? And when you stand out, you're more likely to call attention and get hurt um, and potentially, yeah, face some sort of violence. But at the same time, when you are also you know, in a moment of trying to be your fullest self, there is also internalized violence in not being able to be your fullest self, right? And I think what seems to me that's so beautiful and so powerful about images is that you can have that sort of visibility without a body that's being harmed, right? So the image becomes a standout for something else or, or for a body without necessarily being, um, yeah, in a position of potential danger. And then the other thing that's so be beautiful about visibility is recognizing each other, right? And that happens so much in queer spaces or outside queer spaces and just in public space when you're walking and you see each other, you either like nod or just sort of see each other like I see you, you're part of the fam. And that to me is really special. And the way that we develop languages uh, of belonging to, right? Like with what we wear, uh, how we walk, as a way of showing to each other that we're taking up space in public space too. And I just, I have to jump in because I think you touched upon like this idea of authenticity that I think is, it's, it's a, something that a lot of people talk about when they talk about what it means to belong is when you're free, right? Like when you're psychologically safe and you're free to be, yourself and reveal mm -hmm. the most authentic parts of yourself without fear of judgment or recrimination. And I, I have to say that something else you said made me think about that violence to yourself is like, there is a form of belonging where you belong to yourself. And I also think a lot of people who are um, cis and straight in a lot of ways have a lot to learn from queer and drag people who have that sense of um, belonging to themselves. Like those images of the drag artists being fully themselves in public on Market Street is like, it's just that feeling of like empowerment that I would love to, to be myself in that loud and beautiful and fantastic of a way too. <laughs> you know, it's very admirable. 
totally that sense of affirmation right and to me that the fact that I could also see people who were older doing that also inspired me to be able to do that for myself and even when you're teaching or in spaces you see that people recognize you and they see themselves in your full expression and that can be really powerful when it's used in a you know in a mentoring kind of way right I love the idea of authenticity and I, I think a lot about authenticity just in terms of what museums provide in terms of experiences with like real objects, authentic experiences. And I also love the idea of kind of languages of belonging and thinking about what those might represent. So um, my second question, uh, both of you create work that is engaged with the community and both of you have created projects pre, mid and kind of post pandemic. Um, as artists, how have you seen the communities that you've worked with change as a result of the pandemic and now into recovery? Um, I'm happy to jump on that one. So throughout this time, one of the most incredible things that I saw was our the power that we have to adapt to different circumstances, right? And it's sometimes it takes you for, by surprise that you're even able to adapt so quickly. But for me, seeing how quickly like drag performers were adapting. They were the first ones to do performers performances online, uh, to organize themselves, to call each other out, you know, to call each other into different spaces and organizing performances. That was to me a definition of adaptability that's and resourcefulness that's so powerful. Um, and similarly, when people were, you know, no longer paying attention to digital spaces. They were also thinking about how do we make experiences outside that people will come to because it's also part of like what they do right and so uh right now uh nikki jis and mama celeste who are two different drag performers they started um this event called rolling with the homos so they were like oh let's just have drag queens uh in skates do performance performances and i love that th there's this potential of imagining that things don't need to be what we're used to, right? They can be new spaces with different interactions um, that really create the energy that we need. And for me, that that was really mind blowing in a way because I saw how, you know, um, yeah, just companies or like nonprofits were so quickly trying to translate into a digital space following similar protocols and how other people were actually being very creative about utilizing those spaces in a new way that we hadn't really seen before. Well, I think that um, that optimism is really <laughs> great. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about something that's a little bit of a bummer. And um, one of the, the things that's most personal to me about what's changed over the past few years is like the experience of being an Asian American woman being an Asian American, being Chinese um, in the context of a country where there's a lot of anti-Chinese and anti-Asian sentiment and violence happening. Um, and um, I guess, um, you know, this has always happened. And I think it's just like the increase over time that's um, just like one of the more shocking things about like the pandemic, especially. Um, but, you know, as a social practitioner, I have to say, like, what I'm most interested in is, like, elegant social entanglement, and I have seen that happen in, in Chinatown and in those communities where mm -hmm. resilience is just part of the way of being. It is survival, and um, I would like to just talk for a moment, for example, of, like, one of the things that happened, because, you know, every every restaurant has thin margins, but then you imagine like in Chinatowns, some of the cheapest food in one of the most expensive cities, right? Those margins are gonna be super thin. And because of anti-Chinese sentiment, people stop going to Chinatowns first. So um, one of the things that happened that was really beautiful is the, Ch the Chinatown Community Development Center organized this thing. And it, in my mind, it operates so much like a Melchin project where Restaurants were not able to serve food. So they got, and then seniors were living in low income, single residence occupancy 
buildings where it was high capacity, they have their own little house, their apartment. They have to use a communal kitchen where it's impossible to socially distance. And in that first unvaccinated year when they were the most vulnerable uh, and immunocompromised, they couldn't eat. So what they did is they, the CCDC organized uh, restaurants to become meal kitchens to, to pack individual meals. And then they organized like 2000 volunteers to just come and give meals to the seniors. And they were able to pay the restaurants to help them stay open, to help the workers stay employed and feed the seniors so that they were able to eat and be safe and especially eat their cultural foods, you know, because a lot of food banks don't always have things that are what nourish your soul. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that you reached, that you like we're talking about too, is this, the, the moment that you feel so isolated, you're also craving community and then you really like focus on caring for that community right and I think that happens so much with uh nightlife workers right so there was like a nightlife uh work fund um for DJs and producers and performers that started happening in queer spaces um that was really powerful and also I mean the idea of mutual aid that has existed for many years but I think we saw it even more in the last two as a way of you know, we can't wait for uh, big money to solve all, all of our problems when we're all looking out for each other and there's ways in which we can show up for each other meaningfully. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, so much has changed and so many parts of those changes are, are so sad. And so, so, you know, they're affecting us in ways that we can't even like grasp just yet. Um, but at the same time, I also feel like because we have no other option, people also are figuring out different ways uh, of existing and, and caring for each other. That's lovely. Uh, my last question, um, both of you have created projects that really embrace multi-generational engagement. And I wonder if you can talk about why that multi-generational piece is important to both of you. Well, <laughs> okay, I can go. <laughs> um, I, you know, I never really thought about intergenerational connections so um, intentionally until I moved to the Bay. And I had the chance of meeting Julie Tolentino and Stosh Pila, who are two queer artists um, that are older than me. And I was going through so many things in like 2014 and they really took me under their wing. And it was the first time that I had, yeah, like two older queer folks who were, uh, you know, who didn't have kids, who were both artists, who were caring for their kin in a different way. And I realized how I had never really had a model of like someone who was like, an, you know, like an older queer who was living their life fully. Um, and then I realized how important that intergenerational, intergenerational connection uh, is not only in the way that they were able to provide support or like resources for me, but that we were also having this engagement about how the art, you know, how art has changed us, what kind of art and things we're like caring about and what kind of spaces people need in order to thrive uh, with people that they care about. And yeah, that experience changed my life in such a way that I realized that we couldn't, you know, in San Francisco, you see it even more, right, where there's not really a lot of older folks walking around, and you see people of the same age group, and to me, it's so important to have that connection, um, just because you're, yeah, you're seeing things from a different perspective, and it works differently when I go back home, and I, you know, I'm talking to my tias, and like, my parents and really understanding that maybe the language that they're using is not the most up to date or the most like politically correct, but that I can understand that their care translates and that we're able to communicate and that I have to find ways in which we can relate to each other differently, yeah. Yeah, I think um, for me, um, I thought, you know, with the, the seniors during COVID is like a thing where like 
the isolation of seniors is already an issue before a time of like a widespread pandemic where um, seniors are especially vulnerable. Um, so I think it, it's for me, I have been more interested in engaging seniors in this time. But I also think like generally both Marcel and I are interested in, in working with people who are underserved. Like, and we live in an ageist and capitalistic society where adults of a certain um, young adult to middle adult age, because they have economic power, have more agency. Uh, whereas like young people and older people who are a little bit more interdependent, um, um, like who, who can access resources in different ways, highly dependent on their levels of privilege and economic power of like the people who are their caretakers. Um, that makes me want to do what I can to serve people where um, it might mean a little bit more than anybody who can access anything that they have the power to. Yeah. It's also this way of archiving stories and moments in time that feel very different, right? So for me, even just seeing the, yeah, the GLBT historical archives and seeing all these stories in boxes, like that's a way of, engage, of engaging with something. Um, and especially, you know, queer history and like keeping that queer history such a recent thing um, that there's still, you know, a generation that went through this on their own skin that can share how much things have changed and yeah that just like got to live it in a different way and I feel like people are just such a you know projection of their own times and there is such an important part of that exchange that doesn't happen very often it, it, it usually only happens with people that we're biologically related to and it's so important to have it not only be that way just because it will also give you a sense of perspective that, that, that you wouldn't get otherwise. Thank you both. I'd love to open it up for questions from our audience. Um, we're just in a regular Zoom meeting, so you should be able to um, unmute yourself, um, put yourself on camera. Reos is here, oh, um, welcome. Reos is an artist in residence with a public art program. Um, welcome, uh, you have a question. Yeah, actually perfect. Uh, I'm so glad that I attended. Uh, it's really a pleasure to meet both of you. Um, and, and the work you're doing is incredible. Uh, so I think, yeah, this is sort of, uh, um, yeah, perfect time because I'm actually doing a project very similar where I'm trying to document stories of uh, Latinx and BIPOC, you know, community members here in Palo Alto. I'm actually here at the studio now at Cabrilli Art Studios. So I guess one of my questions, because this is still new to me in terms of, um, you know, uh, community engagement. So I guess my question for you all is, how do you get sort of community engagement and or buy-in uh, especially in communities that you're not from. So like I'm from San Jose, California, and I, and I you know, uh, identify as a Latinx, uh, you know, cis male. So I'm, I'm sort of in Palo Alto trying to gather these stories. And, you know, again, this community is still new to me in, in some ways. So I'm curious, you know, in how you approach sort of your projects in that regard when it's, you know, you're not maybe from that community or um yeah just you know how do you how do you approach it and then how do you engage with the community i guess that's something i'm still kind of figuring it out and um it's ever evolving well i know for me like when a community-based organization has strong ties to the community that definitely makes the outreach much easier so with the palo alto art center grace has um, been the person who has relationships with Avenidas and Eastside Prep. Mm. And then also it really, really helps when there's a champion inside that organization mm. who really understands like it is gonna take time to build a relationship and uh, has that kind of motivation and dedication to be your point person on the inside of that organization. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, one quote that I was thinking about is the Adrian Mary Brown uh, quote of like move at the speed of trust, uh, which always resonates with me. And I see that in a lot of, you know, social practice projects, sometimes people have a very clear vision of what the outcome is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And 
to me that most of the time is just not realistic, right? right? Unless you have a very specific framework of how you're getting that information. But ultimately, yes, it is so relational. And mm -hmm. for yeah. me, it comes to, you know, people sometimes want to engage with 50 people and that's just unrealistic, right? Because, yeah, I mean, even as, you know, we can count our friends with our hands, right? So if we want to make a meaningful connection with someone, I think even if you just have a meaningful connection with one or two or three people, that's plenty, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think this idea of quantity when people are making community-based programs, it's, it's actually like not conducive to making a good um, project. Mm. And then, you know, the, the question that you raise about you, like someone not being from that community is actually really important, right? And it, I think it, there is a sense of, um, yeah, like kinship when you're working with someone who is from that community or who um, shares a positionality with you. And I tend to, um, I tend to like highlight that whenever I'm like thinking about doing a project, right? And then if not, then I try to work very closely with someone who is. Mm -hmm. And that's when I've engaged with different collaborators, right? So I'm not a drag performer. I, I don't really like performing, but that's when I started reaching out to Grace and we think about stuff um, together. And so she's able to think about, um, you know, the songs that we're choosing and how people are taking up space and what they're wearing. And then I can think about the visuals on how I want to represent what we're trying to do together. So I love that moment where you're feeling like there's a limitation on who you are for the project. Also being an opportunity to invite someone who actually has a connection to the people you're trying to reach. Mm. Well, I just I want to thank um, Christine for mentioning Grace. So I want to acknowledge our director of volunteer and Grace engagement, Grace Abushark, who was really instrumental to making Christine's residency possible. And I also want to thank our partners at Avenidas. So um, Thomas has been working really closely um, with Marcel and their project. And I also want to acknowledge Tracy at Avenidas, who have been really great champions inside that organization. Um, if people want to meet Reos, um, he will be at our community day celebration on Sunday, April 10th, um, engaging with the community as part of that project. I'd love to open it up to maybe another question from the audience if someone else has a question. Can just While people are thinking of questions, can I just add one more thing? Yes, please. But I think like that, um, yeah, I think so many things of what Marcel said like resonated with me. Like if push comes to shove and it's about the out art, art outcome and the relationship, I will try to always choose the relationship. And then secondly, I think like that idea of depth versus breadth, I think is really, really, that's a good question. You know, you can get a million people to write one word on a post-it note and it took them three seconds, but how many of them are gonna still be thinking about it in a year? Whereas like if you do a series of workshops with people, you might change their life or they might change your life. And I guess that's the last thing is like, I try to take that thing that I said at the beginning about like local knowledge and feedback as gifts. Like I try to really practice that. So I didn't talk about it so much in this talk, but there's a lot of ways that my projects have changed because I shape my projects based on assumptions because I'm not from that community. And when people tell me, you gotta include Manila town when you talk about Chinatown, I'm like, yes, you are right. I can admit I was wrong <laughs> and the project is better for it. I, I just want to share that, um, you know, for so many arts institutions before COVID, a lot of how we kind of measured impact and, um, and, and relevance was the number of people served, right? How many people have we engaged? And it was, you know, easy, relatively easy to do that pre-COVID and COVID required us to completely reshift how we demonstrate value because it no longer was about sheer numbers of people, it was, okay, now we have to measure impact in a really different way. Um, how do we measure kind of changing someone's life or how do we, and, and it's a much smaller number of people, but the impact can be so much greater. Um, but then how do you communicate that to funders? And that's a whole other story, but, um, but yeah, and this was great. I do want to give someone else, um, anyone else who has a question, a chance to 
weigh in or comment or? Masha raised her hand. Great. So it's not Marsha, it's Kent. And sorry for not having the picture, but that's, it's, it's uh, it, the, um, we're not given the permission. But, <laughs> but anyways, Kent had a I have, comment or a question. Okay, I'll, I'm, a, I'm one of those seniors you talked about. I'm in my 80s, okay? So I was impressed with both of your ability to express yourselves and, and we know exactly what you're, I mean, we know where you're coming from, what you're doing. And Marcel, I love your virtual background. I played around with those and yours is perfect. You, you, I don't know, you got your image nailed down. It doesn't move around a lot. Good job. And uh, Christine. Uh, Christine, but I have another question for Marcel. Marcel, uh, as an older person, uh, when, we, when the black community has, has uh, grown in the visibility and all, uh, we've learned we cannot use terms that they use among themselves. You, you call your community the queer community. Now, where I grew up, that was not a, necessarily a compliment. Can you say that about your community and someone not in it should not use that term to describe your community? That's, that's actually a really good question, Ken. Um, I, I think that's another part about intergenerational connection that's so powerful is how language gets finessed over and over, right? Because we get more specific. So uh, a, a word like, like faggot or like fag, right? Used to be, um, you know, it's, and it still is for some people, a word that would make them feel uh, it was like a discriminatory way of calling someone right and for some people it has felt like uh, there's a need to reclaim that word right but someone who wouldn't identify as a fag wouldn't you know wouldn't be able to use that word for other people because then that would be discriminatory right yeah. um and it happens with many words words and i think that's fine like i i also love that like no you don't get to call yourself that or like <laughs> this person doesn't get to call that like because we can say it between each other right um but i i would, and, I would use it i'm i'm saying i i liked hearing you use that term the way you did the queer community i mean that's a great way i think to describe the community you're in i'd like to be able to say that as as a to as a way to describe your what you're the group you're involved with what you're talking about but i find if i if i put a word on anything that sounds great to me the who, person hearing me say that might think god that you should never use that that so I, there's a broader sense to that yeah and i think it's always okay to ask right and Yes. And ask people like, is that something I can say? And people will tell you whether or not that is. And queer is something that people can use freely now. And interestingly, in Spanish, people say queer, but they write it in the way that we say it in Spanish. They don't use the English way of writing it. So, mm -hmm. so that's cool. Yeah. Thank you very much, both of you. Terrific Thank presentations. You. Thank you. Maybe one more question from the audience before we close. Hi, Anne. Hi, nice Karen. You. <laughs> um, you, you have a question, yay. I do. Um, I think I have an inkling of the, uh, the answer, but um, Marcel and Christine, you, you do so much outreach and things for other people. I just wonder if you could talk about what being an artist and a creator has done for you over the past couple of years. Um, the show demonstrates you know, that art making is therapeutic. And I just wonder if you felt that was a safe place for both of you during the pandemic. Um, well, for me, um, for, I've been many things um, and being a full-time artist was not one of them only until recently. So um, um, being able to to make art all the time and not have to have a day job or be an art handler or um, all this other stuff. That's been an, a tremendous gift. Um, and I think also having a practice that involves psychology and um, this meta awareness that I do not want to make art about wellness without practicing it. I don't wanna make anybody crazy. 
<laughs> making art about wellness, you know? So, um, um, yeah, I, I think, um, be, like, yes, art making is a therapeutic space, but um, so is many other things like exercise and spending time with people and, and enjoying the amazing California weather. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think for me, art making has been both like a tool of survival and resistance in the sense that I also understood so much about myself in the making of art and meeting other people and in that relational aspect. And I also love the idea that art making is a different way of spending social time together, right? So we, we can go to a bar and have a drink, but we can also um, maybe just meet at the studio and create something together. And sometimes that might give us a sense of meaningfulness that might be more um, powerful or more memorable. And, but, but then similarly, as Christine is saying, one thing about uh, being an artist is that sometimes it's seen as invisible labor or like labor that is not being compensated. And to me, that's really part, important part of my practice is that also art is a type of work and it should be compensated. And whenever I work with people, I try to also get, you know, get them paid because they're also artists. And I think that makes the artist practice sustainable. Otherwise you burn out and, and then it's no longer, you know, a, a therapy, you know, like a, a practice that makes you feel, um, yeah, like empowered. Yeah. And I think that actually goes back to Reyes's question is like, that is the next level, I think, of projects that I would like to aspire to do is to pay participants for their time. Because especially if you're trying to engage communities where they're worried about how they're gonna pay rent next month, like that's that's a real question that um, you mm -hmm. know, if if there's if if I can be a funnel, <laughs> I would love to be a funnel. <laughs> It looks like uh, Jim and Valerie Stinger have a question. Maybe this is going to be our last question of the evening. Hi, yes. Uh, this is something that Christine alluded to, and that is violence against Asian Americans and how violence comes into the community. It, it tends to break apart communities. And I'm wondering how artists deal with that because it is a reality. Oh, <laughs> I think, um, you know, this, these are like systemic issues that have very complicated um, um, solutions. Um, as far as an artist, I think holding space for people and insisting on like certain levels of um, respect in building relationships with the people that you work with is really important. I really do think a lot about accessibility. Um, that's how I work towards diversity and inclusion. So like the Nook project is in Spanish and Chinese, and um, it's a pain in the butt to have stuff translated. <laughs> but I think it, it is like a signal, you know, it's like a bat signal. It's like saying like, hey, your voice matters. Um, so these are like little small ways, um, but I would love you know, I think we, here's the thing. I think social change is made by everybody. <laughs> I think artists have a role to play, but I think we all have solutions that we can offer. Very good. I want to thank Christine and Marcel for a fabulous conversation. I loved this. Um, it's such an honor to have both of your work in creative attention and to have you work in such a sustained way with communities here. So very appreciative. Um, I want to remind folks that uh, the Christine's installation is going to transform. So we encourage you to come back um, uh, next week and beyond to see uh, the new installation that documents uh, the residency uh, here um, and encourage uh, all of you to attend our upcoming public programs, information in the chat, um, uh, more information about the exhibition. Karen just put that in the chat as well. The show is up through um, 
May 21st. Thank you all for attending. Thank you once again, Christine and Marcel. Such a lovely conversation. Really appreciated it. This was just perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for everything you do. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Thanks, everybody at the Palo Alto Art Center. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Great okay. questions. And thank you for, for being here. <laughs> thank great. you. Bye, everyone. Have a great weekend. Uh, thank you.